right. Our next presenter is going to be John Diaz. And he is going to talk about um, using drone imagery in project planning. John is a graduate of UMass Amherst with both a bachelor and master's degree in civil engineering. He's also a registered professional engineer in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. He's vice president with the engineering firm of Greenman Peterson Incorporated, which is a nationwide engineering consulting firm specializing in transportation infrastructure. John was a New England Office's Director of Traffic Engineering for more than 20 years, where he was heavily involved in advanced technology, including adaptive traffic signal systems and asset management. For the last year, he's been tasked with developing the New England Branches Innovation Department. This department focuses on researching and applying new technologies to improve workflows, safety, and overall efficacies throughout the life of a project. You threw in efficacies in there. That was tough. <laughs> he has been involved with UAS operations at GPI since 2014 and continues to explore new applications and uses for UAS. We're excited to have John with us today. Well, thank you. Uh, so just I found out I was coming down to do this presentation a few days ago. So the, the title is Using Drone Imagery in Project Planning. So I put together a presentation, then I actually read the abstract. So it's a little different than the abstract describes. Uh, what I wanted to do was, was focus more. There's a lot of uh, presentations on communicating uh, to the public. And what I want to spend a little time in is, is using the drones to develop like a scope of work or really understand understanding a project. This is supposed to be a video, and if the videos don't work, this will be a very short project because it's basically all videos. But, uh, so just a little bit about GPI and, and where we started with, with drones. So we st we've been dealing with aerial mapping and aerial imagery for over 20 years. Back in 2014, we, we purchased our first uh, drone, and it was really just for the cool factor, to do, to do uh, pretty graphics for pr uh, proposals and presentations to get some nice aerial shots, similar to this one. Um, we soon realized that there was a ton of uses for these things, that, that the more you thought about it, the more applications you, you, could, uh, you could apply them to. So as we got more into it, and obviously the regulations changed, it became a more formal process. So back in 2015 to 16, when they changed the regulations and you needed a pilot and you had to conform to all the regulations, you can no longer do flights like this. So this was legal when we did it. Um, it's actually a video, and unfortunately the video is not playing. Uh, but it was, we were looking at an interchange uh, and to see how they, they were going to take the, those are toll booths there and how they were going to take the toll booths out. So we wanted to get traffic flows. Uh, before that. So this is taken from about a thousand feet, which would be totally illegal now to do, but it's a really cool video, which unfortunately isn't playing. Uh, so just what I was going to go through today was just some of the applications, some of the areas in, in engineering and transportation where we've used the, the drones and what we've been able to do with them. So kind of a, a broad scheme of, of topics there, anything from traffic operations to uh, developing media uh, presentations to agriculture uses, and my favorite is the other because those that topic and area just gets bigger and bigger every time you think of something. So, all right, this one is working. So the first video you see there, that was up in New Hampshire. We had a contract for, uh, for construction services of all things. That's how we got our first drone project in New Hampshire DOT. Uh, they had built this two-lane roundabout. It was the first two-lane roundabout in New Hampshire. And I don't know if this is the clip or it was another clip, but they were having trouble with uh, large trucks were coming across here and, and cutting across the lanes. And so they wanted to figure out, first identify where those trucks were coming from. And so when we went out and flew it, and they, they were these bright yellow trucks, and lo and behold, there was a, a warehouse down the street with bright yellow trucks, so they knew where they were coming from. But what they also did was they used it to create a public service message, like this is how you drive roundabouts. Um, so we took the, the raw footage and they did a, this whole uh, advertising campaign. This one, uh, if I can get this video going, is really cool. This is one of my favorite ones. This was a simulation we did for a two-lane roundabout in Hudson, Mass. Uh, so the, we, what you see there was a, was a um, actually Vistum uh, simulation of the, the roundabout. 
And then we went out after it was built and, and flew it. And it just is really cool to see that transition of here's a design, this is what we presented at the public, and then go out and this is how it actually works. Uh, some of the other applications there, the, the middle one here was a recent one we did. Um, we were tasked with uh, redesigning an interchange and we were trying to figure out, again, we had made traffic projections using traffic software to uh, see how the ramps would work. And we were looking at closing uh, the other ramps there because of the weave on the main line there. And there was a concern that our model wasn't really accurately going to depict the potential cues that would back up along this approach. So as a start, we had modeled the existing conditions and we went out and videoed it for about an hour uh, to see how those related the model and kind of uh, calibrate that model. The one below that is in my hometown where I was in need of mass and there's a rail line that crosses through here and the town had put a pre-signal up. It had previously just been a gate and they put a pre-signal up and the, the town was furious because the cars were stopping forever. It was taking forever to go through these, this pre-signal. Well, we went out there in the, the morning rush and we put the drone up and watched it for about 45 minutes and lo and behold that, yes, the traffic was stopping at the pre-signal, but the new signals were getting that, that slug of traffic through the three intersections actually faster than it had before. The difference was you were stopping 200 feet back uh, at the pre-signal, whereas before people would cross the tracks and stop at the signal and across the tracks and back up across the tracks with a safety hazard. So that went a long way of actually showing the public, in this case, that the operations uh, actually work and it's, things are functioning the way they should be. And then finally, this, was, uh, this last one here was just a same type of corridor in, in another municipality in Massachusetts in Haverhill where uh, the town asked us to come in and look at, they had just finished a construction project uh, DOT had done this and they were getting complaints that traffic was backing up. So we went in and took, again, morning and afternoon video footage of the corridor to kind of get a sense of where the backups were and what we could do in terms of improving the traffic operations. This, I think, is from, from uh, start to finish is a really cool application. This is Portland, Maine. And what you're seeing here is actually a 3D point cloud um, colorized point cloud. So that's not an image. That's actually a 3D point cloud from the drone. Uh, so what we did there was we, this was just for a conceptual level design, is we flew that corridor, then we extracted out the, uh, the um, features into a CAD file, and then developed a base plan uh, from that for design purposes and to develop con concepts. But you can just see from, from the, you know, just from the, the video here that that what you're getting from these drones, and this is not a, a $100,000 drone, this is a $5,000 drone, $4,000 drone that you can buy at Best Buy. I mean, we did not start high tech for this, this, these uses. Um, and you're getting some great results in, in that process. You know, you go out, you fly, it takes you know, a half hour to do the flight, it takes a couple days to process, and now you've got a base plan that you can start using for design. Uh, this, is this going? Yeah. So I don't know if anyone saw Mark's uh, presentation earlier on the LIDAR, but this is a similar thing here. This was a closed circuit TV that New Hampshire uh, DOT was looking for placements. So since we didn't have LIDAR for this, we, but we had drones, basically what they did was they gave us a half a dozen locations, spray painted an X on the ground, said this is where we're thinking about putting the camera. We went out, put the drone up to 80 feet, 100 feet, 120 feet, whatever that, that height was that they wanted spun around and gave them a video, and now, now you get an assessment of the site so they can use that for planning and moving forward to figure out the best, the best location for, um, for their, their camera. The, the picture, I wish I had a video of it, but it was a, actually a night flight at an airport. So talk about your waivers. It was a night flight at an airport in Long Island, and what they were doing is they were looking at uh, where to put a control tower. So again, similar to the, the, the camera, they had three or four locations and they went up and basically their concern was would they be able to see, the, and again this isn't a great picture, but they wouldn't be able to see the, the runway lights. The, so they wanted to assess different locations from what would, the con, what would the air traffic controllers see from different perspectives. And it was a simple way. Our guys went down, flew it in one night, gave them some, some videos rather than going out with cranes and buckets and all that to, uh, to assess that. 
And you can also imagine the, again, it was talked about earlier, the, the safety factor of just putting a drone up to 100 feet to look at a, a camera location versus getting bucket trucks out there and potentially closing lanes and, and the, the hassle that, that would come with that. So this is a, an, an interesting use. This is a standard camera, and this is what's called near-infrared. It can be done from, from any camera. Uh, what it does is it, it, it assesses the, it's basically the water in the, in the plant culture. So what this was, this was a, a cranberry bog down in Wareham, Mass, where they were flying it to see um, what sections were dry, what se sections needed to more attention for water. And what they're also doing, this is through UMass, uh, they have a, a, a test cranberry bog down there that they, they're doing kinds of cool things with. So what they're trying to do with this now is associate this not only with the, the water levels, but also to look at uh, invasive species and see if there's a way to correlate the different uh, signatures, color signatures to different types of plants so that they can concentrate um, and look at expanding the, the program. Again, an easy way to get a quick assessment of, of a corridor. This is probably one of my favorite ones. So this is another, you know, now we're talking coastal erosion. Those two pictures you see, if you, if you see the circle, I don't know if you can really see it for, from where we're at, but those are two big concrete, like, I don't know what they are, but they're two big concrete chunks. Uh, and the pictures were taken from 2016 and 2017. And just, I mean, just an image alone, let alone putting it into um, a 3D map and actually calculating the areas, but just, just having those pictures uh, to look at the amount of erosion that happened just, just over a year. And we were talking, you were talking about Puerto Rico. You know, the, the, if, if you have a hurricane there, just to go out and just do a quick flyby after, the, after a storm and get a, get a, a damage assessment. And what's great is you can, you can process this through, through um, drone deploy and other uh, the softwares and can do volumetric calculations so you can have before and after calculations. Uh, we did a whole uh, beach uh, in situate mass, another coastal town in Massachusetts, uh, to give them that before condition. Uh, and then we'll go back out uh, again. We did that in the spring of last year. We'll go out next spring again to see how and map it out and see what's, what's changed from there. But again, that, that image that you see, that the, the video file there, uh, that's again the point cloud. That's, that's not the actual video, it's an actual point cloud. And you can, it gives it away there where you kind of go around the, the density of the cloud, disperses as the flight ends. But again, just it, the, what you get from these things is, is really incredible. So these, these are uh, a couple of unique situation. So now we're kind of considering outside the box and I, I really encourage you to to think about you know what you can really do with these. So the the statue that you see there, the story behind that was it's a it's a historic the Miles Standish monument in uh, Duxbury Mass, just outside of Plymouth Mass. So it's a very historic site. And they were convinced the statue was going to fall because it was cracking. Uh, now, if you look as the drone goes around, you'll see up on the shoulders, you can, uh, it's a little smaller, but you can see that line that looks like a huge crack going down the back of, of Mr. Standish there. And so they were, they were panicking, and now you can imagine if you have to crawl up there, you have to get up there, then somehow you have to get on top of him, you know, with ladders or God knows what. Um, so we put the drone up there, took some videos, and on closer inspection, that was the lightning wire. So, again, you can imagine the, the hassle of going through all that, and in a 15-minute flight, you say, no, it's not going to fall. It's just, a, it's just the lightning rod or lightning wire. Uh, this one here is, a <laughs> is another interesting one. This is a cell phone tower, and as it pans around, you'll notice there's a little inhabitant in there, an osprey with her babies. And you can imagine if you're going up there to do some maintenance work, and all of a sudden you walk, you get up there and you surprise this thing and it comes flying out at you. Uh, so this was, they, they saw something up there from the ground. They didn't know what it was. Again, so you put the drone up, you get a, you get a, a view of what's there, an understanding of what's there. So from your, your planning out your maintenance, now you, now you know what you're dealing with when you get up there. Um, 
the video on the bottom there I had mentioned about volumetrics. It's, it's actually a good spot right there. That was a, um, a gravel pit for one of the big construction uh, suppliers uh, up in Mass. And it was flown completely kind of by chance. It's the next town over from our, our lead pilot, and he was looking for a place to do some uh, testing of his and flights. And he saw this gravel pit, and he went in and said, hey, can I, can I fly over your, your gravel pit? And they said, sure. And so then we brought it back to the office, we processed it, processed all the ortho images and, and brought them into uh, CAD and realized we can, you can very easily do a volumetrics. So we gave them that and they were, they were fascinated by it. They're like, geez, we usually send guys out there literally with GPS units on top of the, the piles and that's how we do our quantities. Uh, so with that, that led to doing uh, a salt um, uh, deposit for mass DOT where they store their winter salt so they could get volumetrics of the salt use and you can imagine just again the other uses uh, for these things. This one again uh, part of it is an after storm damage and other ones in an inspection. I didn't put the video of the uh, the wind turbine which is kind of cool because you can see the drone just kind of drifting every time the blades come around from the, the wash of it and our pilot wants to try and fly through it but trying to discourage that. But again this is something you, you can imagine that it, you're doing the maintenance on this this thing you have to do your yearly maintenance and go up and and check the condition of all your turnbuckles up there and you got to get up there you got to get now if something's that broken you don't know you got to go back down and get equipment or materials to fix it. So this, and this was our first drone in 2014 with a, just a real basic camera on it. And just from this and zooming in, I mean, you can get a good sense of, of what that is. Now you've got drones with proximity sensors and much better cameras, so you don't have to worry about crashing into things and, and you get much better resolution. But again, just the, the uses of these things. The picture on the left there was actually a DPW um, yard in one of the towns. And it was after one of the big storms and they, they thought there was some damage to their roof on, on their supply shed. Uh, so they asked us to put the drone up, do a quick flight over, and sure enough, the, that's a piece of roof peeling off there. So again, a quick assessment. You don't have to go up with ladders. Now you can plan your maintenance out to, to figure out what exactly you need and, and go up and do the repairs. Uh, finally, just the... the uh, there was some talk about thermal imaging on, on drones. This is uh, with that same FLIR camera uh, on, on a drone. This was actually a test building up at UMass. You, you know, thinking of energy assessments or uh, we've looked at it for uh, looking at the concrete piers for, for bridge assessments. Uh, the reason I put this one in, just to show the, the level of, of accuracy you can get from these, I don't know if you can see it, but you see this little dot right there? That is a cigarette butt that that guy threw out. So that, that's the, the uh, uh, differential you can see in the heat signature from these cameras. It's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, the last one there is just, you know, we talked about uh, inspections and bridge inspections, uh, just from the safety factor of, and the efficiency of getting a visual assessment of the, the, uh, the structures. Instead of closing lanes and shutting down and disturbing traffic, you can just fly the drone next to the bridge. That's actually up here from the, the Bourne Bridge uh, going over to the Cape. So, you know, I took a little different approach on this and it was more for thinking of as, as engineers and, and planners, uh, a lot of times we have a lot of questions that we don't know answers to when we're doing scopes and that type of thing. And you can get a great deal of information uh, for internal use and it's also a great tool uh, again the picture is a thousand words it's a great tool to share with the the public and with that that's it any questions uh, you showed the drone looking at an osprey nest have you ever lost a drone to a bird we have not lost a drone to a bird. We've lost drones, but we haven't <laughs> lost a drone to a bird. But they, they, they have come after it before. But uh, we ha did have one time where, where one did, we got a little too close and, and kind of took a, a spin at it, but we did not lose the drone at the time. So have you lost them to trees? We've lost them to bridges. Bridges, okay. 
actually we were we were flying um, it was one of the first flights that our pilot did and he felt so bad we had a brand new drone and he was under the bridge and a wind gust came and this was before you had the proximity sensors and all that so he was manually flying it and he lost a GPS signal and it, it put it up to the bridge and, and hit it and dropped down. Ironically, we were back out on that same bridge this spring and he looked down and he said, I think I see the drone. <laughs> he, we went back up, we got a grappling hook, dropped it down about 200 feet down to the water. We pulled the thing up. It had been in the water for two and a half years. We pulled the chip out of it and we got the video. <laughs> you mentioned earlier how cheap these drones are. He had one, you know, flew through for about you know four thousand yeah. dollars as the cost of the drone. What about the cost of the sensors that were on the drone that actually then collected the point cloud? The, the majority of the the footage you saw there was with a Phantom uh, drone mm -hmm. with the standard camera, uh, generating the three D point clouds through through drone deploy or the other or. Um, What's the other one? Pix4D, thank you. Um, we, have, we have not yet gone the route of li LIDAR. Uh, the thermal there was, we have a partnership with UMass and that's actually their thermal camera. Uh, so we have not gone the route of big, big cost cameras uh, for, for the majority of the flights. We actually set up a, a little test course um, in our office and another company who has their own custom drones, high-end, you know, $100,000 drones came in, and we were getting better results with the, the DJI Phantom. Uh, controlled survey, if it were setting targets on that, we're getting a, a tenth of a foot accuracy. So for what we're doing, and the, the graphics of the camera is great, but what we're doing right now, it seems to be that those are great applications, and if you drop it off the bridge, it's not the end of the <laughs> world. Anything else? One more. Yep. Uh, considering the drones as a traffic monitoring device or tools, uh, uh, I'm thinking of uh, incremental weather or weather impact of when there's a windy days or yep. rainy snow. Uh, do you have like a certain criteria that you put the drones on the sky or not? Yeah, I mean, obviously every, every flight before every flight, uh, I mean, we go through a process of checking waivers, do, doing all that, and then the very last thing is a site assessment the day of the flight. Obviously, if it's windy or rainy or, or snowy, we're not going to put the drone up in, up in the air. I mean, it's, it's like with, with any aircraft, you've you got to do a, an assessment of the conditions. So uh, that, is, that is, I will say, the, the one drawback is, is schedules can sometimes get, get impacted. Uh, because there's just days you can't fly. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome.